Senator Maisie Hirono of Hawaii is known as a fierce advocate in Congress, and it can also be a sharp-tongued critic as well. As the only immigrant serving in the Senate and the first Asian-American woman, Hirono credits who she is today to her mother, Laura, who escaped an abusive marriage in Japan and fled to the United States with her young children. Senator Hirono shares her mother's journey to freedom and her own to the halls of power in Congress in her new memoir, Heart of Fire, an Immigrant Daughter's Story. Senator Hirono, thank you so much for joining us. First, please accept my condolences on the death of your mother who passed away just two weeks ago at 96 years old. This book is a beautiful... Thank you very much, Lindsay. The, the book is certainly a, a beautiful tribute to her life. And, and we'll get to your book in, in a few minutes. But, but first, though, I would just like to, to talk about a, a few other matters. You've sponsored legislation called the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act to address the sharp increase in violent crime against the AAPI community. First, just explain the, what the bill does. And, and are you confident it'll pass when it comes up for a full Senate vote this week? Well, the first procedural hurdle for the bill got 92 votes from the Senate, so it was very bipartisanly supported. My hope is that as we proceed, it'll continue to get that kind of support because the condemnation of these kinds of unprovoked attacks on the API should be one that all of us should take the position on. This is a pretty simple bill that it requires the Attorney General to appoint a person to uh, expeditiously review these kinds of crimes and to work with state and local law enforcement and uh, a community activists to get the word out in appropriate language languages uh, to get the word out so that these kinds of crimes and incidents will be reported and that we will have a da database on which to determine what else should be done. And you recently said that you no longer even take walks with your earbuds in because you fear for your own safety. Talk to us about the impact that these many hate crimes on the AAPI community have had on you. And do you have any concern that it'll be harder to change racist attitudes than it will be to change laws? One hopes that when we change the laws that uh uh, the attitudes will follow, but uh, well, we know that that's not going to be a simple matter because racism is never far below the surface in our country. And yes, I can't think of a single uh, AAPI person, especially on the mainland, who has not uh, had pause before walking around. And certainly I would not walk around with my earbuds on listening to audio tapes anymore. We all need to be very aware of our surroundings. And I hear from constituents and others about the kind of hate, hateful speech. I just heard from one of my employees that, that he himself witnessed a, uh, at a restaurant, a Thai restaurant, where a customer was uh, basically screaming at them to hurry up with their order and calling the people there all kinds of racist names. It was quite fraught, and so these kinds of incidents occur far too frequently and I hope that by Congress and the Senate and the House standing up and passing this bill that we will be saying to the AAPI community and our country that we are going to stand against this kind of discriminatory hatred at any group, directed at any group. Right, essentially saying enough. Uh, I'd like to turn back to your book. Uh, let's go back a bit. Your mother brought you and your brother to Hawaii when you were just seven years old and eventually saved enough money to bring your younger brother and your grandparents to the United States. She worked two low paying jobs to support the six of you. What were those early years like and what did you learn from those difficult times? I learned that my mother was a very courageous risk taker who completely changed my life by bringing me to this country, which, of course, I had absolutely no idea where Hawaii even was or America. And I, I, I grew up on a, a rice farm, my grandparents' rice farm in Japan. So to watch my mother work so hard, and the, as with so many immigrant families, my grandparents had to be sponsored by uh, an, another couple because my mother didn't have, make the kind of money to support them. And so as with so many immigrant families, they arrived in this country and everybody worked. My grandparents worked, my mother worked, my older brother started work really young and we all worked. That's the immigrant experience for a lot of immigrants to this country. And we were this, poor. 
And, and despite growing up poor, as you say, you write that you also had a, a stable home life, a good education and your mother's high expectations, which allowed you to go to college and on to law school ultimately. Truly the American dream, essentially. And it's been around 50 years since you went to college. Do you believe that the American dream for immigrants is still possible today? And, and what are the biggest obstacles that you see? America calls to immigrants like me because we're the country with the possibilities. And as I said, my mother totally changed my life by bringing me here. I would never have had that kind of educational opportunities and other uh, opportunities that I've had, although you know, nothing is handed to uh, any immigrant group or, by the, by the way, women have some special challenges running for office in a pretty male-dominated kind of political environment. but. Uh, America holds that promise still, and we now have a president who wants to have a humane immigration policy, having basically inherited a, 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 a totally dismantled, inhumane immigration policy. So it's going to take us a while. It's going to take Joe Biden and his administration a while to get back to a, a, the kind of immigration policy that I would support. It, one theme throughout your book is your reticence to speak up for yourself, especially around men, some of whom treated you very poorly. You attribute this to the cultural expectations of the time. How did you come into your own and, and find your own voice, and a very strong one at that? I was always a very determined person, but uh, in the culture that I was in, being vocal, aggressive, confrontational was not particularly rewarded. And even now, in the, the, this environment, women's voices are not heard often enough. It is uh, the Trump, uh, Trump becoming the president and the big bully that he was that certainly evoked my desire to stand up to him, and I became much more vocal. But, uh, you know, I was always, when the need arose, I was very vocal in standing my ground. I just didn't have to be that noisy about it until he came along with his uh, bullying tactics and, and his uh, uh, mindless cruelty. So you decided to speak up and claim your voice. Thank you so much, Senator Maisie Hirono. Her new book, Heart of Fire, an Immigrant Daughter Story, is out tomorrow wherever books are sold. Senator, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Aloha. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.